uh, six word summary. So if you could just give me a, a hand if you're interested in sharing. Uh, Suzanne. Um, uh, ritual is no substitute for righteousness. Awesome. That's great. Uh, other six word summary. <laughs> Uh, oh, Lynn, yeah. The... Lynn, are you able to unmute yourself? Am I now unmuted? Oh, that's good. Yeah, go for it, Lynn. Well, good deeds take the place of sacrifices, but isn't that what Suzanne just said? Uh, it, well, it, it's similar, but not the same. Uh, Rabbi Sue? I used words from the Haftarah, but I took them. So the first two words are from line 15 in the English, you pray. And the next four words are from line 17. Devote yourselves to justice. All right. Uh, Susan? Uh, from despair to hope, personally and communally. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a pass on the end. Good, all right, these, these are great. I hope, um, I hope that you guys appreciated the exercise. This was um, something that one of my teachers in rabbinical school would often have us do. Um, she had ramped up the difficulty. She would assign us four or five commentaries on the same verse and then ask us to assign a single word to each of the commentaries. Um, but I think it's sometimes helpful to distill what's happening in um, a text, whether that's the Haftarah or a commentary or something to uh, distill it down to a clear and short focus. One of the biggest surprises of this period of coronavirus and, and quarantining, sheltering, uh, for me has been that I have, uh, I would say against all odds, become a morning person. Um, but which was not always the case. And uh, the farther back you go in my personal history, uh, the later I was inclined to wake up. Um, so I ended up in college, I took only one 8 a.m. class uh, in all of the four years that I was in college. And it was, uh, it was an intense struggle, um, made better only by the fact that the teacher was my uh, academic advisor. And when I shared with him, when I was registering for classes and I shared with him my concern about the early hour of the class, um, he shared with me that uh, he was in fact very much a morning person. He would wake up at four every morning uh, so that he could exercise and play piano before he then drove 45 minutes into Boston to teach his 8 a.m. classes. Um, but with, and this was, uh, you know, so instructive for me with um, what I thought of as uncharacteristic uh, compassion for a morning person, uh, rather than judging me for uh, rolling out of bed at 1045 and running to my 11am classes, he said, uh, he told me a story that he had once uh, been invited to teach in the extension program, you know, the, um, the night college for people, um, older students who are working, and so they're going to get their BA in the evening. Um, and so the classes there, let's say, would start at 6.30 and would run until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and he said he did a semester in the extension program and he just couldn't manage it. It was too late for him and he understood exactly how I felt about the 8 a.m. class. And it was and so I, I felt like that gave me the strength to take it. Um, but I really wanted to take the class um, because the class was called Warfare in Antiquity and it was every bit as cool as it sounds. Um, and in fact, he, uh, Professor Sammons shared with me that the reason why he taught this class at 8 a.m. was to prevent it from being oversubscribed. Um, so and the class was great fun. I mean, it was, you know, battle maps and, um, you know, if. If we were at BZBI, all of us together in the sanctuary, I would have brought out my, um, my it's, it's a book, um, I can't remember the title, the author is Wari, that was always how we referred to it in class, but it's this like large illustrated book of arms and armament from, the, from antiquity. So it's like, you know, each country and time period with illustrations of what the soldiers would have worn and full color, it's, 
anyway, it's good fun. When we're back in shul, ask me, I'll show it to you. Um, and it was, and it was, there was so much in the class. We did not talk about anything relating to Jews or Judaism. Um, apparently none of our wars were significant enough to make the cut in a semester long class. Um, but in the end, I learned something that turns out to be very important for understanding Jewish history. Um, if you follow the Jewish newspapers, what you'll notice is that in, um, in even numbered years, there will be some kind of, uh, in, in the March and April issues of Jewish publications in the even numbered years, there will be a spate of essays arguing for historical evidence for the Exodus. And then in the odd numbered years, there will be essays arguing against the historicity of the uh, Exodus. So this has been true at least for let's say the last 16 or 17 years, but I think it's probably goes back farther than that. Um, and one of the, one of the pieces of counter evidence that the, that the odd numbered year articles will bring up, um, people will argue against the Exodus as a historical event because the only record of the Exodus that we have is in the Bible. Um, and uh, many of you have done ac various academic study, you know what you're always looking for is outside evidence, outside attestation. You know, where is the proof um, from outside of an event happening? And if you can, sort of triangulate a Jewish source and a Roman source and archaeology, then you can establish that, okay, there was a temple in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in the year 70. The following things happened, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can say with strong reliability were historical events because we have multiple points of evidence for them and we don't for the Exodus. The only point of evidence that we have for the Exodus is that in the Torah, it describes the events of the, the slavery and the plagues and the exodus. And what I found out in this warfare and antiquity class is that uh, that argument is not as sound of an argument in this case as it might be generally in historical studies. Uh, and we can know this because we do have Egyptian accounts of battles that they fought against the Hittites or against the Babylonians, uh, where the, the Egyptians describe their ringing victory, their resounding defeat of these other enemies, and where there is other evidence, both documentary and archeological, that shows that the Egyptians lost and lost pretty badly. And there are other cases where there's ample evidence of an Egyptian defeat, and the Egyptian sources simply never mention that they went to war at all. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised if the Egyptians chose to omit a record of a slave uprising that led to the defeat of their army and the loss of hundreds of uh, elite chariots. Um, that's not the kind of thing the Egyptians are going to put little hieroglyphs on the wall of, this is the time our slaves rose up and whomped us. Not their style. Um, I don't mean to pick on the Egyptians. I don't think we need to pick on them. Um, because I actually think that that approach is more typical than not of how nations do history. Um, in general, right, um, we have this idea that history is written by the victors, um, but to the extent that the losers are still writing history, they tend to write it in ways that reflect, uh, if not well on them, then at least as not badly as possible. Except for us. Um, the rabbis who structured they structured the Jewish calendar, but in a sense, they structured Jewish history as well. They set up the narrative that defines how we read our own history, embedded that calendar and that history with a cycle of four fast days that commemorate the darkest hours of our history. Uh, the fast of Tzom Gedalia, which marks the assassination by Jews of one of the Jewish leaders, that created the political instability that started the, the crumbling of the autonomous Jewish kingdoms. 
uh, the 10th of Tevet, when the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians began, the 17th of Tammuz, which was two and a half weeks ago, uh, commemorating the breach of the walls of Jerusalem, and the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av, the biggest of all of these days of commemoration, this coming Wednesday night and Thursday, when both of the temples were destroyed. Um, so I, I do want to put the question out to everyone. Um, you can just kind of raise your hand if you can think of it. Um, I, is there any similar example in American life of a day where we mark a terrible loss, defeat, tragedy for America? Um, and I, I, I couldn't quite like come to mind of what that would look like, uh, but I wanted to put that out there and see if any of you have ideas or suggestions. It's even uh, more. Steve, September 11th, but we're not really commemorating it, but I, I mean, it's in an official way, but it's absolutely noticed in the press and everywhere else every year. Oh, that's a good, that's a good example. That and Pearl Harbor Day. Right, except, so there I would say like, that was my first thought, right, is Pearl Harbor Day. But I wonder like at what point in American history did Pearl Harbor Day cease to be a, a major, you know. A, a Only major... I would say in the last 30 years as, as it got farther and farther away. Certainly when I was a child, it was noticed every year. Well, oh, okay. So that's interesting. So it, it lasted for some time, but it didn't persist. But I think September 11th will persist and will eventually be officially commemorated. As I, as I was, Rabbi Abe, as I was uh, saying in our small group, maybe not on a national level, but on a personal level, every businessman knows that he learns not from his successes, but from his failures. And you remember your failures to know what to do next time. That's good. I want to hold that thought. Um, I'm just going to repeat it to make sure that everybody could hear what, what um, Mork Sivan was saying, that, um, right, that, that successful business people know to keep their failures in mind uh, because we learn from our failures and we grow through our failures. And to maintain them, I, you know, my, my father of blessed memory sent me one time um, an article about someone had organized a failure conference where everyone who was invited to present was somebody whose um, business had gone bankrupt or their product had gone to market and failed or, you know, it was, it was like a, you know, the kind of three-day business conference you would imagine um, but they deliberately invited everyone to come and tell their stories of, of failure, of setback, of downfall for exactly more what you're saying, that those are the places that are, can be most instructive for growth and learning. Rabbi Sue? I think that people who um, have been on, I don't know the phrase you use, the losing side of history, um, have often commemorated that, that time. I mean, I think here locally in Philadelphia, we have folks who remember when those houses were blown up in West Philadelphia. They, re they remember it every year. Um, the Palestinians have named what we call Yom Hatzma'ut, they call the Nakba. Um, and I think there are other, more and more, we're going to be seeing this naming of, of things we need to remember. I think about the LGBT community having a day of trans remembrance for all the trans folks, particularly trans women who have been murdered. So it's not just, I mean, it's the other side of what we might call, you know, black pride or gay pride, um, or for us, the amazing Yom HaTzma'ud um, parades that we've, many of us have participated in. Sue, uh, how about the Stonewall riot? Oh, perfect. That's a perfect example. Um, but the, actually it's not because it's not about a loss. It's about, it's about a victory. 
It's right. About- so I was thinking, I, I had the same thought when you started talking about Stonewall, and I was thinking about this, um, right, you know, the, there's a complicated duality of Yom HaShoah that, right, the full name in Hebrew is Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura, and it is, right, a day of marking the loss, but also a day of marking the, the heroism of the resistance, right, which I, think, which I think is what you're saying about Stonewall also, is both about the persecution and also about the strength that it took for people to resist that. Actually, I can uh, think of, of two examples. It's Gary. Yeah, Gary, go ahead. Um, one is the Cherokees celebrate every year the Long March to mm-hmm. Oklahoma. And secondly, the Armenians make a very big deal of that horrible um, they're, they're, they're equivalent of the Shoah uh, and use it, both the Cherokee and the, and the Armenians use it as why they have to succeed in the world and do well to get back from what happened to their peoples. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Harris, Suzanne, and Alex. Yeah, this, uh, so it may be a generational thing. Uh... Um, but, um, you know, every November 22nd, um, you know, when I, as soon as I realize when I'm finally had my coffee that it's November 22nd, right. the first thing I think about is this is the day when I was a kid that, you know, the whole world changed because JFK was assassinated. Um, so it, it may be different than the kinds of things we're talking about, but nonetheless, it, you know, it's obviously a horrible event that, I at least remember, and I'm guessing a lot of people my age also remember. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne. Oh, you mute. Here we go, unmute. I I think one of the things that's different between the two kinds of events that are being described here is, you know, there's a clear sense of memorial days, right? And turning a memorial maybe into a moment of, of, uh, we got to do better, as Gary just said, you know, or... um, but, but to think about sort of a, an active continuing civilization that sort of commemorates its defeat in other than memorializing in a sacred way for its dead, is, it's hard to come up with. And I think it may be the fact that we didn't have, we don't have, you know, like a functioning uh, state that allows us to be the, these people who commemorate that defeat, right? Because I think if you're a government, if you're running a country, you, you want to memorialize your sacred dead, but you don't want to celebrate defeat, right? Because that's not how governments continue to succeed. So I, those of us who remember when, when, the, when, when the memorial to the Vietnam veterans was finally built, there were about four or five memorial days after that that were really focused on what was true about Vietnam and what happened to us and how did we quote, lose that war. And you, you know, like now it's all about the valor of, of the soldiers rather than a national reckoning with what the heck were we doing and how, what did we lose? You know, I, I, so I think there's a difference between a people that has really lost us, the Armenians, the Cherokee and a functioning government or state that has to figure out what do we memorialize and how do we use history to continue to tell to shape historiography right i mean like that's what this is about and states have a very different mission than peoples mm-hmm. thank you alex Hey, I was actually going to say something very similar, uh, because my, my first thought also was the, the Vietnam uh, Memorial in D.C. and how viciously some people were opposed to it when it was first proposed, the Mayan Memorial. People were saying, you know, it's, it's black, it's rising from the ground, it's commemorating the dead, it's, it's painting the war as something to be ashamed of. Um, and they eventually compromised by adding a, a more traditional statue to the same general plaza because there's this kind of like reluctance uh, to admit when America's nation has has been defeated or has experienced anything um, to that sort of scale of, um, of destruction. 
And I'm also thinking of even like um, Armistice Day, you know, almost every other country in the world has Armistice Day, which is still very much focused. Um, I know specifically like in Britain, it's focused on the tremendous loss of a generation in World War One, or it's, it's just generally a much more somber day than our equivalent, which would be Veterans Day or Memorial Day. Um, so I think that sort of uh, refusal to really engage with um, with loss is something that we see on kind of a, a statewide level um, in America that we don't see on like smaller ethnic communities that can uh, deal with this kind of reckoning. Um, thank you. Um, and, and I want to thank you all. A number of you have pointed out about um, the the role of a day of commemoration in a, a people who ended up on the suffering side of history. Um, and I think that that, that I, I hadn't thought of that uh, before in my preparation, but I think that certainly fits with, you know, the arc of Jewish history, let's say from the year 70 to the year 1948, right? You know, that was a part of who we were. And, you know, the analogies to Native Americans or to uh, the Armenian people are, are helpful in thinking about, like, what does it mean to be a, an ethnic people that continues stateless over an extended period of history? I'd like to suggest that this kind of commemoration, um, yes, is a story of defeat, um, but is actually a story of strength in defeat, as uh, Mort was suggesting. Um, because I think that, um, as Suzanne was saying, the, the state's inclination to push aside its defeat um, is a, a sign of fragility in the national sense of self. Um, you know, and again, you, some of us started to bring up personal experiences. We know this from personal experiences. It takes a deep sense of strength and inner security to face up to shortcomings um, and to face up to loss. Um, and the the key to this for me is in um, kind of in the middle of the Haftarah when God says to the Jewish people, "In you kashanim yalbinu, be your sins like crimson; they can turn snow white." The rabbis gave us this theology in which the destructor, the, the prophets before them, but the rabbis take the prophets and sharpen this theology in which um, the destruction and the loss that we mark on Tisha B'Av are consequences of our deviating from the path of righteousness. Um, and for the prophets especially, uh, as Rabbi Annie highlighted for us at the beginning of the service, um, from our abandoning of the responsibility to protect the vulnerable members of society, right? Uh, you know, for the Torah, it's the widow and the orphan. Uh, for us, we might say black lives and trans women. And, you know, as we can think about like, what are, who are the people in our society today who are mortally vulnerable? Um, the, the Torah and the prophets and the rabbis expect us, God expects us to be champions of those people whose lives are on the line. And, and the message of Tisha B'Av, the message of the Haftarah is, is actually that our fate is linked to the fate of the vulnerable even if we are not ourselves vulnerable. And if we, if we even want to take it one turn further, the theology of Tisha B'Av says that the Jewish people's failure to protect the vulnerable members of society left them vulnerable themselves. But the loss of
Okay, so hopefully <laughs> Rabbi Abe will, will be back um, with us in just a moment. Um, I'm also having some internet troubles this morning. Let's see. Uh, and he's back. back. Okay. You're back. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think too often, uh, as even just looking in the news today, we see political leaders who are using force to appear strong in a way that I, that I perceive as covering for a deep sense of insecurity and fear. Um, and, and particularly troubling for me is the use of force by those with political power against those who are vulnerable. We have, to our misfortune, leaders who are not strong enough to admit to uncertainty, to admit to worry. Um, and, you know, as the, the, old, the old saying goes, in a democracy, you get the government you deserve. Perhaps as citizens collectively, we have not been strong enough to elect leaders who will be honest about not having all the answers. Perhaps we as a nation have been too willing to employ pe to, uh, to elect people who will tell us that they have it all figured out, even when, if we're being honest with ourselves, we know that most of these questions are not questions that one person can have it all figured out. Right? Race is not a question in America for which there's going to be a single straightforward answer. Healthcare is not going to have a single straightforward answer. Um, the, the growing disparities in income and wealth are not problems that are going to have a single straightforward answer. And part of the message that I hear in Tisha B'Av is a warning that we should not confuse strength with invulnerability. Right? To be strong is to be able to say we have problems that are going to take more than a generation to work out. Strength is to say there are people who are vulnerable and those with privilege, those with power, need to have the strength to yield some of that power so that the good things in society can be shared more equally and more broadly and more fairly. And ultimately, this, this image that Isaiah gives us of red turning white, um, for me, is a reminder that our tradition believes that we can come back from defeat, that we can even come back from defeats that are self-inflicted, um, and that that holds true for our physical lives as well as for our moral lives that holds true for us as individuals, as a Jewish people, as a, a nation state. We can pull back from our self-inflicted defeats if we are strong enough to be honest with ourselves about what's involved. We wish everyone a, a Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Um, and I'll turn things over to uh, Rabbi Annie. We're going to turn to the prayer for our country on page 148. Um, with these words of Torah, our um, powerful kavan.